Three balls and two strikes. The overshot and Bassett deals. And Bonds hits one high. Hits it deep. It is out of here. 7.56. Bonds stands alone. He is on top of the all-time home run list. WRJN News Time is 436. So what you just heard was the broadcast of Barry Bonds' record setting 756th home run. The man at the mic with the call for the San Francisco Giants grew up on a Sturdivant farm. He spent about a decade in Major League Baseball as a second baseman for the Cleveland Indians and San Francisco Giants. He's made it quite a name for himself as a broadcaster now for the San Francisco Giants. And this Thursday, He's going to be one of the inaugural inductees into the Racine County Sports Hall of Fame, and we welcome to WRJN, Dwayne Kuyper. Dwayne, thanks for joining us. We do appreciate you being with us today. Yeah, this is pretty exciting stuff. I can't wait to get back home. Indeed. So now you've spent all season out in the road broadcasting. Now it's kind of a downtime for you. You can relax for a while, right? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, although a year ago at this time, you know, we were traveling, we being you know, the Giants broadcasters with the Giants as mm-hmm. they were on their way to a, a world championship. So, you know, given what happened last year, I think we would rather be working, but it didn't work out this year. So it is time to kind of recharge the batteries, look forward to the holidays, and mm-hmm. kind of reacquaint yourself with the wife, the kids, your friends, and... uh And it is. It's a good time of the year. It really is. Right. Well, I'll tell you what. You mentioned about the end of last season. Why don't we just review that very last out of the 2010 season for the San Francisco Giants. Right-hander for the Giants throws. Swing and a miss! And that's it! The Giants are world champions as they come pouring out of the dugout. Circling Brian Wilson. The bullpen. Flying in from left center field. Dancing, hugging, and celebrating for all you Giants fans, wherever you are. Giants fans, this party is just getting started. Now, Dwayne, being somebody who never played for a world champion, it has to be exciting for you to be the broadcaster for a world champion. That had to be a pinnacle moment for you. Well, you know what? It really doesn't get any better than that. Mm -hmm. And when you... You know, I, I became part of that Giants organization in 1982. I got traded to the Giants from the Indians. So, you know, that's when I became a Giants fan. That's when I became a Giants employee. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and they had spent a lot of years prior to that not winning a world championship. So it took 52 years. And when you get to be the guy behind the microphone to make that final call. I mean, it really, it, it does not get any better than that. You know, and I will say this, I caught a break because uh, at that particular time, John Miller, who is our number one radio guy, was doing ESPN radio. So I got to slide into his chair while he was doing the network stuff and really enabled me to, to be the guy to make the call. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, it just worked out where uh, it was just a, a magical year, and you know, a year that when you get involved in this game, you, you don't take those years lightly because they just don't happen all the time. I mean, we're not the the New York Yankees that get the postseason every year. We're the Giants, and when we do get there, we're just hopeful that we can go pretty far into postseason. And, you know, the ideal thing is to win your last game, and that's what they did. Yeah, the folks in San Francisco and the whole Bay Area were waiting for a long time for that moment you called there, Dwayne. That's for certain. Now, now let's go back many moons now. Back uh, when you were growing up on a farm in Sturdivant, and uh, around this time you were probably on the tractor doing some picking or chopping of corn along the way. And uh, along with that, it's a case where you, had, you grew up in an atmosphere that really... Uh, encouraged baseball. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, my dad is still alive. He's, he's going strong at, uh, at 86. Mm-hmm. He's still on the farm that, that I was raised on, right at the intersection of, you know, I-94 and Highway 20. And, 
And, you know, and we've been, we being the Kuipers, you know, we're really proud of the fact that, you know, my grandfather came here in the early 1900s. He farmed, you know, they had a bunch of kids. And, I mean, there are Kuipers running around all over, you know, Racine County. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody in our family is, is, is really proud of that name and, and how it generated you know, you work hard, and you enjoy your family, and you raise everybody the way you think it's right. And then if there is something that you can enjoy besides farming and raising your family, and in our in our family, it happened to be sports. And it really wasn't just baseball, but it was the one sport that my dad played. My dad played a lot of softball in Racine, and he was a fabulous fast-pitch softball pitcher. And that's how we were raised. We were raised watching him, and we were raised being totally taken by the Milwaukee Braves with Earl Gillespie and Blaine Walsh. And and as far as we were concerned, it didn't get any better than to watch my dad pitch or to listen to the Braves on the radio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I was really just fortunate where I had some ability. The right people saw me play. I got drafted. I had some good years in college. You know, you catch a few breaks and you're in the big leagues. And then, you know, after 10 years, now you're sitting behind a, a microphone. So, you know, look, there isn't anybody that has lived a, a more charmed life than I have. I know it. I savor it. I don't take anything for granted. But it still always does go back to one thing, and that goes back to where you're from and how you were raised. And, uh, and we were raised the right way. Now, I know I was talking to a few people from uh, affiliated with the Burlington Baseball Hall of Fame, and your name popped up a number of times, and you mentioned that uh, there were some games between Sturdivant and Burlington when you were playing youth ball where it was getting kind of chippy at times. Well, I mean, we, you know, we had some kids in Sturdivant that were really, you know, we had really good players in Sturdivant. Mm -hmm. you know, we had Dennis Chapins, and we had, you know, Mickey Thomas, and we, we had... A whole slew. We had the Harrison brothers. And uh, and our teams were good. And, and we had a guy by the name of Hank Johnson that he drove the bus. He managed the team. He got everybody together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, those are the, the things you don't forget once you get far away from your youth. You don't forget the people that, that, that did drive the bus, that did help you, you know, get all these games and put them all together. Mm hmm and, uh, and our rivalry with Burlington was, was fabulous because they had good players, too. And uh, inevitably, it would turn out that it could get chippy, and you would see guys starting to, to push and shove and scream and yell at each other. And I, I told you the other day, I remember one day where my dad came out of the stands and, and stood on home plate and said, enough is enough, boys. We're here to play baseball, so knock it off and let's play baseball. And, uh, and we did. We finished the game, and everybody was fine. But they were always good games against those Burlington teams. Mm -hmm. Well, along the way as well, it's like uh, as you grew, it turns out that you became a member of the very first J.I. Case High School baseball team back when Case High School was a brand-new school. And then from there, you moved on to uh, Southern Illinois University. And along the way, you ended up getting... Your name was called in the Major League Amateur Draft a number of times. The uh, final time, we, now you had to be either the first pick or close to it in 1972 when the Cleveland Indians picked you, correct? Yeah, there were a couple of different, I mean, in, in those days you could get drafted twice a year, once in June and once in January. Mm -hmm. And I got drafted you know, a number of times, but the last time that I got drafted was in... Uh, in January of '72, and then that's the year that I signed. Right, and you and you moved up to the big club in September of '74, uh, and in the following season assumed the position at second base for the Cleveland Indians for a number of years, becoming the team's captain. And of course, as you mentioned, you moved on to San Francisco, basically spending the '70s in Cleveland and uh, a portion of the '80s in San Francisco, and then moving into the broadcast booth. How did that happen? That you ended up moving from the field into the broadcast booth, Dwayne? Well, you know, about halfway through my career, I mean, the first six years I played, you know, I figured, you know what, I'm going to be a manager. 
and I'm going to be a really good manager. So that's what I want to do. And about halfway through my playing career, you know, I realized that I wouldn't be that good at being a manager. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wasn't really into running into the manager's office as a player, which meant that if I was a manager, I probably wouldn't want players to come, to come into my office. And if you don't have some type of communication skills with your players, you're not going to be very good. So, you know, I, it turned out that I wasn't that sh- I mean, I was shy in high school if I had to make a speech. But once I got around a microphone as a major league player, I wasn't that shy. Uh, you know, I had a decent sense of humor. Mm-hmm. I wasn't afraid to poke fun at myself. And, uh, and then I had a couple of radio shows. I had one in Cleveland as a player, and I had one in San Francisco as a player. So when I got out of the game and a job opening came up in San Francisco, you know, they asked me if I was interested, and, uh, and I said, absolutely. <laughs> so that very first year, I think I did about 35 games, and I did them for 100 bucks a game. And, uh, and I really just did it for the experience and to let the Giants know that I could do this. And, uh, you know, and that really led to doing more games the next year. And then by, then by like 1987, I was doing 80 games. And by 1989, I was doing them all. Mm-hmm. And, and doing them well, obviously, since you've won a number of Emmy Awards for your work. And just from listening to your work, you are a good quality broadcaster, I must say. Well, it may not be Bob Euchre, but, uh, <laughs> but then, you know, I never got a chance to, to do what I do in Milwaukee. So, you know, mm-hmm. look, I like what I do. I was really fortunate enough not only to have a dad that, that was, you know, a good softball player, but my dad was an auctioneer and still is. Right. So I got, you know, he's got a good voice. I got the pipes from him. You know, as an auctioneer, you got to talk fast. So I, I, I must have learned a little bit of that from him. And now you know the game because you played it. And now if you can communicate with the fans, you know, then maybe you can do this. And uh, and now after 25 years, I'm still doing it. So I think I kind of got the hang of it. Right. And it's, it's a family thing, too, when it comes to uh, baseball in the whole Bay Area. Because on the other side of the San Francisco Bay Bridge, or Golden Gate Bridge, you have your brother, Glenn, doing the play-by-play for the Oakland A's, too. Yeah, Glenn has is is almost done it now 10 years for the A's. So mm-hmm. he essentially does the exact same thing I do, except he does his job in Oakland. And, uh, and Jeff, my our middle brother, has produced every Giants game on TV that I've ever done. Really? So he's 20-plus years into, into uh, you know, this whole baseball and TV and, and it probably doesn't really look good from the standpoint of here my dad raised three boys on the farm and as soon as they were old enough to make a decision on what they wanted to do, they ran as far to California as they could. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we just did it because it's something that we really loved. And, and he, he always said to us when we were growing up, I don't really care if you guys want to be farmers. I just want you to be happy in doing what you think that you can do best. And uh, if it means you have to stay in baseball or you want to stay in baseball, you know, then so be it. So uh, I do have a sister that lives in uh, outside of the Milwaukee area, so she's kind of the glue as to what's going on within our family, my mm-hmm. sister Kathy. So we know what's going on, and, uh, and we get back as much as we can. And that's why we I can't wait to get back next week because... My sister will be there. My two brothers will be there. My dad will be there. We will have a full... My daughter's going to come. So we're going to have a, a full table representing the Kuiper family. And that's what's going to be great about it. And there's going to be a lot of other appreciative people there, too, in regards to what you provided for our county when it comes to, uh, the, in terms, comes to the world of sports. Dwayne Kuiper, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you next Thursday night. We're going to have a good time, and, uh, and, and obviously from uh, California, the, all the Kuipers send their very best to the city that we were raised in. And uh, it's not just a great city, but it's the people that are in the city. That's what makes it work. Indeed. Dwayne, thank you very much. We appreciate it, sir.
Hi, it's you, Beth. Mm-hmm.